shadow of a doubt that he's still alive and well. I've seen the characteristics of his handiwork in my life, preacher. How many of you can say that this morning? Amen. Amen. So good. So good to be able to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords this morning. We have different people that are working, different ones that are sick this morning. So we have a lot that are out today. But I am so grateful for the move of God that we have been experiencing at Gray Street. God has really been turning over soil. He's really been breaking up the fallow ground of people's hearts. And there are some of you that haven't been able to be, be in services, but you've been watching online. But how many has been blessed even online? How many say, oh, I've been watching online, and the Lord has really spoke to me even there. I always encourage people. I want to tell you, I, don't, I, don't, I try not to ever tell people to do something that I don't do myself. I'm going to give you a great piece of advice. Are you ready for this? If you really want to be inspired regular on a regular basis and you really want to be fed by God's Spirit on a regular basis, I think that music is a fantastic thing. I listen to a lot of music myself, but listen to good preaching. I'm not just talking about my preaching, but I'm talking about good, solid preaching. Why do you say that, Brother Myers? Because this is something that personally has been a benefit to me as a pastor. Nearly every day, if not every single day, I have a routine. Usually, I will get my shower first thing in the morning, and while I'm taking a shower, while I'm getting ready, getting dressed, I'm listening to preaching. You may think, well, why would you do that? Well, many reasons, and I can tell you that a lot of times when you hear Pastor Myers get up and preach, just the hearing of the Word of God is inspirational. It, is in, it inspires thoughts in your heart, in your mind, in your spirit. Have you ever got around somebody that did something so well and they did it with such proficiency that it inspired you to want to do a better job? It's like going to somebody's house that's spotless and you, and you go home and you're thinking you, it just inspires you in that regard. Or you're a preacher and you hear somebody just deliver a profound word. It makes you want to preach better. And I can tell you that the inspiration comes through the word of God. Inspire yourself. Uh, some of you may not real, realize this, but you, we have so many outlets through Gray Street Church, and we've got revivals from years ago. Uh, we've got many preachers that have preached for us, a whole list, a laundry list of preachers, just a great men of God that have preached at this church over the years, not just Brother Myers preaching, uh, but we've got Spreaker. If you've never heard of that, just download it on your app or your phone. It's just like Speaker, but with an R, Spreaker. Download that app. You can go on there and you set up that account on there. You can set it up so that you favorite it and follow it. And every time we have a service, you get a notification and you'll be able to listen. Once you have favorited it and followed it, you can go through and there's a list. You can scroll and you'll be scrolling for a long time. There's a whole lot of preaching. And some of you that haven't been at Gray Street very long and you say, Pastor Myers, I missed a lot of preaching from years that I wasn't here. Guess what you can do? You can go back and you can listen to it. It will encourage you. It will fortify you. There are some of you who say, Pastor Myers, I read the Bible sometimes and I don't always glean. For anybody ever read something you don't really so-and-so begat so-and-so and, -so and you, you get done and you feel like you're more confused than when you started? Let me explain something to you. Preaching and teaching has this beautiful way of opening the reservoir of your mind to begin to become creative and think about it from a whole brand new perspective as the preacher or the teacher dissects the Word of God. So it's imperative. Go back. Listen. Feed your soul. 
You know, the Bible talks about in the last days, it said whenever you're challenged or tried and such as that, it said that you'll be able to open your mouth. You don't have to give thought to what you're going to say and you'll be able to, uh, the Holy Ghost will bring back to your remembrance things to be able to say, scriptures and verses and the power of God and such. But if it's not there, if it's never been there, it's not going to bring back to remembrance nothing that's ever been there. So it's good to get the Word of God in you. I'm just encouraging you. We have YouTube. We have Spreaker. We have iHeartRadio. We have uh, Ustream. We have Facebook Live. I mean, uh, all over the place. And God has used that to touch a lot of lives all over the place. And I always encourage you, if you're on social media, even being when you come in here, let me explain to you just how powerful all this is. Some folks will get so old school that they don't want to tap into the benefits that this generation has. Listen, the devil's going to use stuff for his own good. Say amen to that. Just as simple, you walking in the church on Sunday morning and you checking in on your little social media. Somebody says, ah, that's not for me. That's cool. But there'll be some that will. Just you checking in, guess what that does? All of your friends on social media, now they know where you're in church. They know where you go to church. And sometimes people be in a valley. Sometimes they're going through a low ebb. And it's just enough for them to check something out and get inspired to want to be a part of the church. So, so many different applications to it. You hear a message preached and you share it. Guess what? There have been some people that started going to church here simply because they heard a message. Anybody can say, we listened to preaching before we ever came here. There's some that are they're here this morning. And so thank God for that. Be inspired. Be encouraged in the Word of God. We're going to come to you this morning for the, for the uh, morning tithes and offering. This is how we keep the bills paid at this church, not to live lavishly or to do lavish things, but simply keep the bills paid and continue to move forward in the ministry of God. And uh, so I'm going to do this this morning, receiving this morning tithes and offerings. Sister Myers uh, will put the link into the broadcast this morning uh, for those of you online that would like to give there. If you're ever out of church and you're sick and you say, Pastor Myers, I believe in being faithful in my tithes, you can always go to the church website. There's a link right there that you can give tithes and offering right through there. We've had people that do use that. I've said this before. I've been pumping gas and paid my tithes while I was pumping gas. Right through our online thing. We have a machine in the back. If you have credit card or debit this morning. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to have you all stand to your feet, if you will, all across the house of the Lord. And uh, while you're getting on your feet and, and what have you, I, I want to make a special request. I'm going to put Brother John on the spot this morning. Oh, boy. Here it comes. Uh, I don't know, but I don't get to hear Brother John sing very much anymore. Anybody else agree with that? Not enough. You're not in trouble. But there's a song that Brother John has sang a, a lot in the past, and I know he knows it, and he knows it well enough. He could probably be in a coma and sing that song. But I want to hear you sing The Lighthouse this morning. Can you do that for me? Just for this one time, I won't ask you them tonight or another time. But, uh, but I appreciate Brother John, his tenacity in the spirit and continuing to serve the Lord, his, his, uh, uh, his favor with the Lord. And I tell you what. I told my wife this yesterday. Sometimes people say things, and if they don't tell you, you never know. But I told my wife yesterday, I said, I know Brother John's always played the piano good, but I think he's getting better and better and better and better. Anyone else agree with that? Just really, I mean, I'm not kidding, just really. Yesterday, Sister Amanda uh, was singing, doing a fantastic job at the memorial service, and I'm listening in the background. I'm hearing Brother John play it, and I mean, he just, he's all over that piano. He's just making it talk. He was doing a good job, wasn't he? Doing a fantastic job. But he is going to be, Lord willing, tonight he will be bringing a word from, from God. Give him a hand for that. So um, Brother Myers will be taking a little bit of a break tonight and, uh, and sit back and ask the Lord to feed me. And so I want you to come. I want you to be here in support of your church and support of me and uh, Brother John tonight. And so get ready for that. So as soon as I give the word, I want you to get ready to come up. Bring your offering up here. If you don't want to walk up here, uh, we just, you just bring it, get past your offering to somebody. They'll bring it up here. We've been doing this for a few weeks. We'll, we may do this for a while. And I want you to fellowship a little bit on the way up and on the way back. I don't ever want to embarrass anybody, but it's good to have our sister right here. Give her a hand this morning. Good to have you with us this morning, dear. Thank you for being at Grace Street this morning. As you bow your heads, I'm going to ask Brother David Mobley, if he will, to bless the Lord's offering. And as soon as he's done, step out on an aisle, bring it up and put it in the offering pan or go to the machine in the back, fellowship a little bit, and don't forget, as soon as we're done, if we are able, we're going to do our children's mission march right after the offering. Go ahead, Brother David.
Amen. Come on up. Give is given unto the Lord as we say. Be a blessing to the church. Kingdom work. John is going to bless us with a song this morning. Brother uh, Danny, Dan the sound man, media man, would you get ready? He is going to uh, probably need a little volume on the mic. I think that mic is labeled as the baby grand um, singing mic. I need a whole lot of mic. Again, I cover it up. God's good, isn't he? Amen. Pray for me. I don't sing much anymore. And the reason why I sing, I've always got a voice that don't go high anymore. It's good. I'm getting younger, boy, right? I guess. I'm not sure. <laughs> See? 
too quiet. Way too quiet. say 
some folks here this morning that know that man. If you enjoyed that, give a good hand of thanks to them and give a good hand of praise to the Lord this morning. Did a fantastic job. What a beautiful song. I believe we'll go right along with what the Lord has put in my heart to preach about. Years ago, I knew a seasoned preacher and he he had gone to a church when he was evangelizing many, many years prior and he told a story about how that during that particular meeting, he said he had been coming from and going from different meetings, different this meeting, that meeting, what have you. And sometimes the evangelist, they preach so much from one revival to the next that it's very easy for you to just pull one out of the archives and preach something maybe that had already been preached before. And he said during that week, he was exhausted, worn down from the previous revival So he grabbed something he was going to preach on that first night of revival. And he said when he got to the pulpit, he said there was a piece of paper taped to the very top of the pulpit there. And it said a very simple message. said, whatever you do, just preach Jesus. Right there in the pulpit, he said every every night, he said that every time he'd go to that pulpit, he said that message staring right at him in the face, whatever you do. Just preach Jesus. And he said, during that meeting, he said, just as an evangelist, he said, I began to contemplate the idea that there is so much that gets preached, so much that gets said, and it deviates from the person of Christ that the greatest message any one of us can preach is whatever you do, preach Jesus. There are many different things like the roads of Atlanta, Georgia, that all tie into one central area. And many of the things and themes and topics that we talk about in the ministry and through the preaching of the Word of God, they all tie back to Christ. But we can never get away from Christ. Can you say amen to that this morning? 
We're going to preach to you with the Lord's help for a little while, talk to you from the heart of God out of 1 Peter chapter number 1, and we're going to start with verse number 18, and we're going to read through to verse number 23. 1 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to start with verse 18. When you have it, if you will, stand for the reading of the word if you're physically able. We don't have very many verses here to read, but I do want to read this in your hearing, and I want you to receive it. A lot of times a preacher will give a text, and uh, we just kind of gloss over it, and then the preacher will dissect the Word of God. But I prefer that as we read it, that your mind not be distracted with anything, and just think about what the Word of God is actually saying. By the time the preacher gets around to dissecting the Word of God, it makes so much more sense. The Bible says here, starting with verse number 18, For as much as you know, you are not, say that word with me, redeemed. Say it again, redeemed. With corruptible things as silver and gold. From your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for who? For you. Who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead, gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. How many of you are glad that it doesn't have to be in a church? It doesn't have to be in a preacher? It doesn't have to be in a denomination or movement, but that our faith and our hope might be in who? God. Verse 22 said, Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Verse 23 starts out with something very imperative. It says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. I want to share a little thought with you, and I may go back to this later, but the Holy Ghost dropped this into my spirit this morning, and I wrote this down. Jesus took the brutal and turned it into beautiful. The message I'd like to preach for a while this morning on the payment has been made. Raise your hand to God and ask him to have his way in this house. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We ask you to speak to hearts and lives like only you can this morning. God, break every yoke that binds, and I pray that you will liberate the captives and set them free. Open up the prison doors, the blinded eyes, God, that you will, that you will set at peace those that have been bruised and injured, God. Give them the liberty, God, from the vices of this world. And we'll give you praise for every good thing that you do in this place. And those watching online as well, listening, we'll give you the praise for it, and everyone can say amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord here today. One of the things that came to my mind as I began to look into what God had laid into my spirit to preach to you, I began to look back into my childhood and think back as a young man. Some of you can identify with this, but I believe that the older that you and I get, we have to suffer as Adam did. How many knows what work is? There's some people, they want everything for free, but how many of you know it takes work to get anything in this life? But we got to suffer the same way that Adam did whenever he was kicked out of the garden. But when we began to labor and we began to work for the things and struggle for the things that we obtain in life, you gradually become acquainted with the difficulty it takes to purchase something. It's not as easy as you thought it was whenever you were five years old and you came running to mama in the grocery store with two or three matchbox cars and you wanted mama who didn't barely have money for groceries to buy several toys and then you stomp off like a spoiled brat because mama didn't buy it for you and you didn't understand that with tears in her eyes, mama's doing all she could to figure out what meals to prepare and buy for that week. How many understand that concept this morning? But you see, it gives us a deeper appreciation as we begin to get older of the value of a purchase price. I can still remember being a young man, and I, I began to learn this principle and concept at just a young age. 
At about 14 years old, I, I got my first real job. I, as a young man, I used to mow grass and do a lot of things that uh, a lot of times you don't see kids willing to do. But at a young age, I got out. I wanted to have things in life. And we were very poor as I grew up. We didn't have very much. We ate a lot of fish sticks and white rice with stewed tomatoes over it. My mom made things out of nothing. And there were just we grew up poor. We didn't have a lot. I've told you that just as a young man in elementary school, I can remember having to wash the same pair of Huckleberry Finn high waters every night so that I had something to wear to school the next day. And I remember back in the day, my pants would have big holes in the knees and my mom would buy these patches. They were the ugliest things you ever see and iron them patches into the knees. And anybody, Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. And the struggle, the struggle was real. The struggle was real. People today, they think they're going without because they got two cars and one don't run or one needs brakes and the other one's running just fine. Somebody say amen to that. But you see, it may be a difficult thing to sacrifice and labor for our own needs and desires, but the greatest of all human sacrifices that I can imagine as we begin to understand the concept of the sacrifice is when somebody else sacrifices something that they don't have to and it makes little to no indirect benefit to themselves. If you think of it this way, in our everyday life, marriage becomes beautiful because a husband may go to work and work a job and work 40 plus hours a week to make sure that he can take care of a wife and take care of children, <coughs> excuse me, or a wife may do the same thing in the generation that we're living in. It is a beautiful thing when you are in a marriage that people make sacrifices one for the other. When you get a lopsided marriage is when you got problems in a marriage. And you got one person giving 100%, the other one doesn't want to give anything. That is the reason why. That little things, I think, can strengthen a marriage and make it more beautiful than some may understand. I don't expect my wife to make all my food, wash my laundry, or do everything for me. As a matter of fact, I take joy in doing things for my wife. The other night, my wife doesn't like to go out to the car at 3 o'clock in the morning in the car to be parked way away from the house. And so I know that. Without her asking, I go out and get the car, back it in as far into the carport as I can, just as a sign and a token of my love because I care for her and I want to make sure that she's taken good care of. And so, and I even do my own laundry. That way she doesn't have that burden. And if I've got space, uh, a lot of times I will go in and grab her stuff and put it in the washing machine and dryer. And I fold my own clothes. Uh, uh, the other day I came in and I do all that myself. And no roses on me we just work together it's not a one sided marriage and the other day I came in brother John and I looked down and I noticed that she had gone through the extra effort to fold all of my undershirts that were in the laundry and I was thankful for that I never mentioned it just like there are things that I may do that she may not have to come along and say I just want you to know I, I appreciate it what's bad is when you're in a relationship and every time somebody does something they think the world ought to stop picture frame it and make a gigantic deal because you washed the dishes tonight. Praise God, you washed the dishes one time in a 25 year marriage and you want a plaque? Come on somebody and help me out. But the thing is, uh, is that in a marriage or in a relationship, the thing that makes this thing beautiful is the fact that somebody is willing to sacrifice uh, something that they don't have to sacrifice. They are willing to do something that they may not be a beneficiary indirectly Amen. From that, there are times uh, that I may come in uh, and I realize my wife's just got off work uh, and I know she's going to want a cup of coffee and so I'll go on over and turn the machine off so it can be heating up. That way when she comes in, it's already hot and ready to go. I came in the other day, wasn't feeling well. My wife went in, she made me a sandwich and brought it back. I thank God for that, but that marriage uh, is beautiful uh, and we can say things to each other. We say this a lot. We love us. Us. We love us, what God has given us. But it is because you've got two people who are working in accord with one another, making the sacrifices. Uh, and I can't tell you any more beautiful thing. It's one thing to work hard, to buy things for yourself. But when somebody goes out of their way to do something for you that they did not have to do, is anyone in agreement with me? Those are the greatest of all human sacrifice uh, that we can imagine here this morning. It's like 
like friendships. Uh, when somebody gives you a birthday gift uh, or a birthday card or they sit on the phone uh, and listen to you while they could be in di- at the dinner table with their family and listening to your troubles and woes. Uh, that friendship to make time out for another friend, uh, it makes a beautiful friendship. Uh, and it's much like raising children who are beautiful. Hey, Amen. I can tell you this morning uh, that I thank God for the one grandchild that I've got right now. But sadly with children, uh, it sometimes takes these children getting older, having children of their own to realize uh, what their parents went through uh, to provide for them. Uh, I can still remember being about 15 years old and I got myself in a lot of trouble. I was a mischievous child. Uh, I'd stayed in a lot of trouble, had a rough childhood uh, and I was in a boy's home at the time in Gainesville, Florida and uh, in that place uh, they would let you get weekend visits to come home. I'd have to ride the Greyhound bus and my mom would make sacrifice so that I could come home. Uh, There were times uh, that my mom would not eat lunch all week long uh, and she would take her little bit of money that she did not have. uh, Amen. Because she would would use that money that she would normally buy lunch with uh, and she would save it up uh, until the end of the week uh, so she could buy a Greyhound bus ticket so that I could come home to be at the house with the rest of the family. You see, it had it, it took me getting older and realizing what it feels like to go without lunch, to go without something, to provide for somebody else, for me to understand and appreciate the value of a sacrifice. Times as parents, uh, you look at your children and you think uh, that they have an attitude like, "Well, you owe it to me because I, you, 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 you know, if you didn't want to do it for me, you shouldn't have had me." Uh, sometimes parents want to look at their children and say, "Look here, I ain't got to do nothing but give you a place to sleep uh, and give you some food if it ain't a bologna sandwich." Uh, so if I take you to Chili's and give you a forty-five dollar meal, uh, you better perk up and be happy about it because uh, I ain't got to do this. Say, man, uh, I don't gotta buy you Christmas gifts. I ain't gotta by your birthday gift. I do that out of the love of my heart. Uh, Can you imagine uh, sacrificing uh, for people that don't appreciate it? Uh, You want to cut a person to the heart? Uh, Let's do something for somebody they don't appreciate. Somebody help me and say amen. Uh, But I can tell you uh, that that is exactly what we see when we look at the vicarious sufferings of a Savior. As we read in 1 Peter 1 and 18, the Bible there pointed out that he says to the church, you know that you you were not redeemed uh, with corruptible things uh, like silver and gold and all of that. Uh, but he says this to the church. Uh, you understand the word redeemed this morning. Uh, you're not redeemed uh, with money. You're not redeemed uh, with corruptible things. You were not bought uh, amen, with silver and gold. Uh, but you were purchased. You were redeemed uh, with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, the ultimate sacrifice. Uh, the word redeemed redeemed means bought back, released from blame or debt, liberated from consequences to repair, to reform or to restore. In other words, you were not restored with silver and gold. You were not bought back by silver and gold. You were not released from blame or debt by silver and gold. You were not reformed or restored by silver and gold. But I I paid the price. The payment has been made that you can have liberation in your mind, in your spirit, in your life. Somebody say it with me this morning. The payment has already been made. He said in verse number 19, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Some of you that already know about the word of God, you have the understanding that the Bible said all the way back in the Old Testament, the reason that they would sacrifice turtle doves and rams and things of that nature was because the Bible pointed out to the church that there is no redemption, there is no ransom. Amen, that you cannot, there's no remission except by the shedding of blood. And I began to think on the way to church this morning uh, about that ransom, about that redemption, and about that remission from sin, and about the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, And I thought about how that he was beaten beyond recognizing uh, at the whipping post. Uh, You know, the Bible said uh, without the shedding of blood, uh, there is no remission of sin. Uh, And some would try to point, uh, I'm not gonna get doctrinal here, but just hang in a minute. Uh, you think about Jesus 
place in the garden as he's praying. The Bible said that his sweat became as great drops of blood. Some try to say that the first blood was shed in the garden. You can believe what you want to. I don't believe that. Why, Brother Myers? Because the Bible said it was as great drops of blood. You can try to say it was the blood capillaries in his head and all of that, but that's just scripture fabrication. That's like the Bible saying the devil is as a roaring lion. He's not a roaring lion, but he's like one. Amen. Whenever Jesus prayed in the garden, his sweat became as. It was so large. It was like large drops of blood flowing down his face, sweating profusely. But we see the first place that he probably had any blood shed was when they planted that crown of thorns and they pressed it on the precious face and skull of our Savior trying to make a mockery of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I can see little beads of blood begin to run down the sides of his skull. Amen, where it pierced into his flesh. But I began to think to myself, the Bible said without the shedding of blood, do you know, amen, it's a little bit different than being poked. It's a little bit different of being grazed or scraped and his skin might have been penetrated. But it wasn't like an all out shedding of blood. Much like the Old Testament when they would take the brazen altar and put a sacrifice on the brazen altar and they would put that knife to the throat of that lamb and they would shed the blood. It would drain the blood out like a deer hunter when they came and bleed a deer out. They would take that knife and he would shed the blood. And I tell you, it wasn't just a drip and a drop, but there was one place where it all took place. I told you this morning the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said Jesus took the brutal and turned it into beautiful. Do you know where your redemption really took place? It took place being beaten. He began to be beaten beyond recognizing. That was the place when the cat of nine tails ripped the flesh off of his body and his little organs and entrails were hanging out and blood began to flow out. Blood was shed. Blood was shed for the remission of sins. Jesus took the brutal, and somebody say he turned it into beautiful. And I'm going to tell you this morning, when I read this text and I thought about the redemption of the Son of God or the purchase price of the Son of God, he tells the church in verse number 21, he said, being born again, not of a corruptible seed, but of an incorruptible. He had to pay this price. Thousands of years have transpired. Kings and princes have sat on thrones. Generations have come and gone. And in the background, the Father in heaven had a plan of redemption in place to redeem mankind back to himself. We were lost, but whenever redemption came, if you accepted, you would be foul. But you see, that is the goal of it all. Amen, he's paid the price, but it's up to you and me to receive it. Do you know that every time that you reject God, every time that we reject the healing, reject the promises, uh, for a payment that's already been made. I began to think to myself how foolish that that might be. Can you imagine this morning uh, if that somebody had got themselves into a fix or a place where they had messed up their life and gone to prison. Can you imagine what that would be like? Uh, And then all of a sudden somebody mediates on your behalf and they began to talk to the judge and they pay the price to get you out of jail. Do you know how crazy that it would be uh, if you'd stayed walking in that six by eight cell when the payment's already been paid. Somebody say amen. I began to think to myself this morning uh, how foolish that it might be. Uh, But I read a story about two homeless men uh, that began to prick my heart thinking about that inheritance. Uh, Do you know this morning uh, that even in America they've got an uh, an unknown uh, inheritance database. Uh, That's for people who maybe had an inheritance uh, by law that was passed down to them, uh, but they know not of this inheritance. Uh, they live day in and day out without this inheritance. Uh, I read about two young men who walked the streets of Europe, I believe it was, uh, and these two men, 
uh, they were homeless and lived in absolute poverty. And by night, they lived in a cave. Uh, by day, they walked the streets of the city looking for scrap metal to turn in for just pennies uh, to try and get by, to scrape by. All the while, they did not know they had a relative uh, that had died uh, and had left them in U.S. dollars uh, five billion dollars in an inheritance. Can you imagine this morning uh, walking down the streets of poverty and then no shoes on your feet, uh, nothing to eat days in and days out, while in the background you're absolutely a billionaire, uh, but you've got to claim the inheritance. Somebody say, God help me right here. You got to be careful not to walk away from the atonement of Christ. Now, we've heard theological explanations of things possibly in the past. But I want you, I've, I've preached this in the past, and I want to remind you of something. Is there anyone here that knows without a doubt 100% what the word atonement means? Raise your hand. I want you to see this morning the importance and the relevance of the word atonement. He made an atonement for our sins. The word atonement, if you break that word down, that first part is at the second part is one, and meant means with. In other words, at one with. I'll give you a minute to think about that. Whenever he made an atonement, that breach that Adam made in the Garden of Eden, God said whenever the Son of God died on the cross, he made an atonement. He gave us the opportunity to once again be at one with God. He made an atonement. You don't have to live in sadness and sorrow. You ain't got to live lonely and broken. The payment has already been made. Somebody say amen. I want to tell you this morning, it breaks my heart to think of just how much that Christ has done and how much people overlook and they don't understand the value of the payment price. I began to read in the Bible in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, it said, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, that man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all. That word ransom is a bargaining price to purchase something back from captivity. He gave a purchase price to purchase you back from the captivity and the power of hell and sin. Say amen. In Mark chapter 10 and verse 45, it said, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. He gave his own life for the ransom price of our captivity. In 1 John 4 and 10, it said, Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us, that and he sent his Son to be a propitiation for sins. Some of you that are here this morning, you may not have known what atonement is. Others may not know what a propitiation is. But I want to educate you here. The word propitiation in the original was the word hilasmos, which means atonement. Propitiation is the act of standing in for, just like the scapegoat that we read about in the book of Leviticus, that one got to go free while the other it was a sacrifice. Do you remember the one place where in the book of Leviticus that they were making a sacrifice for a man that was a leper, for the, for the leprosy, that, that, that rottenness disease of the flesh? And do you remember I preached about this a few years ago? There were two birds, two doves, and one bird. They would take that bird and hold it over a basin. They would take the bird, the one of the birds, and they would cut it. They would take the blood of the one bird and pour it over the other bird. Over a basin of blood and water. An earthen vessel of blood and water. Do you remember in the word of God where it said that a soldier came by and pierced his side and forthwith came blood and water. And it was in an earthen vessel. It had to be a flesh man. He was 100% God, 100% man. And that earthen vessel forthwith came blood and water. We don't understand why one bird had to die while another one got to live. But that bird became the propitiation for the sin. He stood in for the other bird. Aren't you glad this morning that Jesus Christ stood in for your payment of sin? Somebody say amen. I, 
I, I just want you to understand this morning that it's like what it's like to reject the payment that's already been made for us. I began to creatively think in my mind what it would be like amen, in our everyday language if someone went to purchase you a home of your dreams. Uh, amen. And they say all you got to do is move in and it's yours. Chances are you wouldn't continue living in a one bedroom apartment with scarce accommodations. If someone came to you and said that front porch that wraps all the way around the house in the location you've always wanted to live in, it's paid for, it's all yours. There's a good chance that you wouldn't keep living in a shanty with nothing hardly to eat. Chances are you would be making, you would be making arrangements to get out of the place you were in so that you could get into the place that's been paid for for you. There are some of you, you may be like me, there are certain automobiles that I really enjoy and there are some of you that are just like me. There are certain vehicles that I would never be able to afford but I still admire those vehicles and I think to myself, if I could ever afford that. My boys, sometimes they'll say, Dad, look at this Bugatti. Look at this Maserati. God, look at this. Dad, look at this uh, uh, Lamborghini. And Dad, I'm, mm -mm, I'm a pickup man. And they say, Dad, yeah, this is how kids do. I did the same thing. Dad, what would you do if somebody gave you a Bugatti? I said, I'd sell it and buy me a truck. Come on now. I said, I'd sell it, and that's what I tell them. I said, I buy, I buy a truck. I said, if there's money left over, I buy a, a few trucks. I said, because I ain't interested in driving a Bugatti. But I'd be driving me some, I mean, I'm talking about some tricked out, Dodge Ram, lift it up. It'd be the baddest looking Dodge Ram you ever did see. <coughs> That's just me. But you see, whenever I think about the idea and the concept, how foolish that it would be to have a parent that came to you and said, hey, baby, you know that car you've always wanted, that BMW you've always desired, that thing you've always, oh, I, mama bought you, daddy bought it for you, there it is, go get it. And they just keep sitting on the couch playing video games. Just imagine this morning that that inheritance that's already yours because of a payment that's already been made and you never accept the inheritance but choose to live in the poverty of sin. This is naturally disturbing but in my little bit of study on this one small element of this message, I discovered that there are people who had massive inheritances and died never knowing it. Let me tell you something. You have next door neighbors. You have friends. It always bothers me when people are so anxious to go on a mission trip to minister to people when they won't even invite their next door neighbor to church. Huh? And I'm going to tell you, I don't mean this to be disrespectful. I, please don't misunderstand me. But a lot of people, what they want is they want, to, they want the showmanship of I went on a mission trip. I reached out to somebody. Honey, you can do the same thing by begging a pie and taking it to your next door neighbor or mowing that old lady across the street's grass for her without nobody knowing that you did it. Somebody say amen. Because the reality is this is that there are people all around you everywhere that you look. You work with people most likely. You may babysit the kids of somebody. You may know somebody. You may have people in your family that right now the inheritance is beyond this world. And that literally, their inheritance is beyond this world. And there are some of you that you've told your family, oh, if I could, I would get you out of debt. I'd fix your credit. Honey, if I could, I'd buy you a house. I've got well-meaning people that love me and Sister Myers. They know we don't own our own home. We've even have some that have tried to get check their credit to find a way to help us to get a home. Some that said I would do anything to help you get a house of your own. Do you know I hope that we are just as tenacious and, and more excited about trying to get our friends and family into that eternal home that's already been paid for. There are things that have already been paid for. There are times that we sit around and we loathe and we cry and we moan, oh God, woe is me. I'm going through the valley of depression and, uh, and let me tell you, I've been there and I know what it feels like. Sometimes we need 
God, amen, to take that rod and staff and comfort us and encourage us and remind us. You don't have to be depressed. The price has already been paid. But pastor, I'm discouraged. You ain't got to be discouraged. He has bought your victory. He's already paid for your victory. Pastor, I feel like I can't go on. He's already paid for your get up and go on. He's already paid for your motivation. He's already paid for your redemption. He's paid it all. The price has already been paid. Sometimes we look at our situations and we think, God, I don't have a $5,000 down payment for this and for that. And I'm not one of those preachers that preach all about the material things because some preachers make it sound like God is a Santa Claus and I don't mean to sound that way but I just came to tell you when you're faithful to God, God will take care of even the things that you, the desires of your heart. Amen. If your mind is stayed upon him and you're serving God. Amen. In the big things and the little things. There will be times that God sees the goodness of your heart and the sincerity of your heart and God will bless you with things that you may not have even asked for. How many of you agree this morning that God is better than any parent? Let me ask you parents, you mothers, you, you, maybe, maybe even godparents or maybe you don't have kids or maybe you're an aunt, you just bless your, your nieces and nephews. And, but let me ask you, has there ever been a time that you heard one of your children say, boy, I'd like to have that. And you don't say nothing. And then one day, whenever they get in the car for school and you reach back and hand it to them, they didn't ask for it. They just said they'd like to have it because out of the goodness of your heart, you love them that much. What I'm telling you is, is that many of the things that we live beneath the privileges and the blessings of God, that all we've got to do is claim it. I'm not one of those preachers that are just naming and claiming, blabbing and grabbing. Oh God, that Porsche 911, that thing's mine in a five bedroom house. I believe in moderation, but I will tell you that a lot of times we're sitting around, we're moaning and crying and loafing when the reality is that God's already paid the price for you to have what it is that you need. That is the reason why that I believe that he said if you ask it in my name I will do it amen I believe that that price has already been paid he said by his stripes you are healed that's the reason why the next time that somebody's sick in their body and afflicted amen and you got a loved one that's laying there maybe dying or maybe they're eating but stage five uh, that you could say honey amen I love you and I just want you to understand the price has already been paid for your healing the price has already been paid for all of that and whether it comes by a transplant a chemotherapy or or whatever God you chooses to allow. God can work it out. God can make it happen. And I can tell you this morning that our God still reigns on a throne. And the price has already been paid for what you need. You don't have to walk in defeat when the price has already been paid by those stripes, the lacerations, the wounds on his back before Christ ever came to this earth you will read where the book of Isaiah he says that he came to set the captive free did you hear what I said earlier that whenever you're redeemed you're ransomed and there's been a remission of sin that is someone who's been in prison sin's prison and the purchase price is made for you to go free I don't want to embarrass anyone, so I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I want to ask you an open general question. Is there anyone here this morning, you've ever got yourself in trouble with the law and someone had to pay a bail to get you out? There's a sense of obligation and appreciation from the common man when they know somebody has put their house up for them or they put up some valuable thing that they've worked their entire life for, for you to have what you have, for you to be able to walk out the doors of those prisons. You see, here in America, I believe that we have become so gospel-hardened. This is the reason why that you can go to other countries and evangelists love to go to these other countries and preach because people act like it's the greatest thing that they've ever heard. But in America, we've heard it so long that people become hardened by it, and we fail to understand. Every once in a while, Pastor Myers has to go back to the very ABCs of the gospel and remind people that the payment's already been paid for everything you're struggling with right now. You're, you're living through a, a circumstance and a season of your life 
life that you feel like the bottoms completely fell out, he's already paid the price for right where you're at. You say, Pastor Myers, I don't know what's going on in my marriage and I don't understand what's going on here and there. And I tell you, you need to lay in an altar between before God and you need to begin to claim the promises of God because the victory's already been paid for. For every stripe that he bore on his body, that's already been paid for. For every time that he was whipped with that cat of nine tails, him in glass and bone particles in the middle of that ball that they would take and rip a man's flesh off of his body and then when he hung up on that cross and he began to asphyxiate because they say when you hung uh, it would block off your airway and slowly you would die of suffocation can you imagine uh, between the whipping post uh, and the crucified Christ uh, amen he went through a lot for you to have everything you have uh, and you sit here today uh, and you say well I don't know if I'll do that or not Uh, I'll tell you whenever you get hungry enough you'll eat Uh, if brother Myers came in here and prepared a table with everything you loved on it and everything you needed on it uh, and you came in here and told me you were hungry but you left without anything I tell you you ain't hungry uh, but when you hit rock bottom uh, that's the reason why some people they gotta come to prison uh, that's the reason why some gotta get sick uh, why some gotta go through hardship uh, and go through seasons of lack and want uh, because they gotta come to a place uh, where they see their need for a Christ uh, who's already paid the price uh, and I tell you show me a starving man uh, and that man will eat almost anything you lay out before him uh, if he's hungry enough uh, when you hit rock bottom uh, you'll hear the preacher and he says listen the price has been paid come and dine come and dine I can tell you that as a young man I'm going to give my little testimony here and then I'm going to try to close here in just a minute as a young man running from God I didn't even know I had a calling to preach I didn't know that God would one day call me into the ministry Sometimes I think God doesn't show you everything because he knows that you may run the other direction. I didn't know all that. There were times my wife would invite me to church and I would go and with Jimmy I'd sit on that pew. I was blessed by the music. Sometimes I would get goosebumps. It all sounded well. But I would sit on that pew and I wasn't really ready to let go. There were preachers that I talked to afterwards that preached to me during that season of my life and some of them, they doubted their own self. Maybe they didn't preach the right message. Maybe they didn't say the right thing. When in reality, I wasn't ready to let go. I wasn't ready to lay down what I had. The Bible calls it filthy rags. The rags of sin. I wasn't willing to trade that for the life that had already been paid for me. You may tell you the reason I believe that was, TJ. Because like that immature child who brings five matchbox cars to mommy, he does not fully comprehend what has been done for him. He doesn't realize that the things that he cannot have are nothing in comparison to the things that he has been given. That does settle in your soul. As that little child who looks up, I remember Justin, he came to us at a young age. I won't tell you the whole story. It's kind of funny in a way. But he brought us an army man. The army man was like $35 or $38. And this was, you know, he was about this big. And $35 and $38 is a lot of money now, but it was even more back then. Mom, I want this. No, honey. No, you can't have it. And he don't really understand why. Why won't, you, why won't you do that for me? I see you doing other things for my siblings. I've seen you do things for this one and for that one. Why, why not me? Sometimes with a parent, the parent cannot fully explain it all because the child wouldn't be able to comprehend what all has really been done for them. Honey, your daddy was sick last week and he didn't get a full paycheck this morning I got up with a notice from the electric company that our electric is about to be turned off we're driving a car that hasn't had the oil changed in 15,000 miles I'm overwhelmed I'm stressed I came to the store. I've walked down every single aisle trying to make meals and put meals together. 
and you're worried about a, an army man. Son, if you only knew what mom and daddy's doing just to keep a roof over your head, if you only knew what we've done just to make sure you had food on the table and something to eat and clothes on your back and the many sacrifices that it made, you would be so grateful for everything that's been done. And in my own spiritual, mental immaturity, I didn't understand what had been done for me. But as I have grown in the Lord, I began to realize just what he went through. The Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation following the bloodline that was kept alive and remained the seed that God preserved. He didn't just send an angel from heaven. He sent his only begotten son. He gave us a foreshadow with Abraham and Isaac. Abraham went all the way to the top of the mountain, and guess what God said? There's a ram in the thicket. Just as Isaac was about to do something as a pagan practice that God would never ask him to do, specifically God leads him in his direction to show him a foreshadow of what God the Father would one day do with his, his only son. Do you realize Isaac was the promised son? And you have to ask yourself, why would God ask Abraham to take the promised son, the one that, was, that God made the big deal about the fact that he is going to be a promise to many generations and so on and so forth, and now I'm going to sacrifice him? But you see, that was only a foreshadow of things to come in the New Testament where God the Father, the Bible said, you know the verse, John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I wonder how many of you, there are people I've met, they wouldn't give up lunch for somebody, let alone a son let alone the promised son, let alone your only begotten son. How hard would it be for you to give up your daughter as a sacrifice for people who probably wouldn't even appreciate it? Do you understand what I'm saying? You wonder why the preacher gets hurt and cut within his spirit whenever people reject God. It's not because he realizes it's not necessarily that they're rejecting the preacher. They're rejecting the payment that's already been paid. It's as simple as saying, I receive it. I accept it. You're here this morning. Brother John, will you come to the piano this morning for me? And you may say, Pastor Myers, I have gone through some seasons in my life, even some things recently. Sometimes I think, well, maybe I need a counselor. And I'm not here to criticize godly counsel and wisdom. But sometimes I'm thinking maybe I need, our marriage needs counseling. But maybe I need a counselor. Maybe I need a therapist, a psychologist. I'm going through so much. My, I'm pulled in so many ways. I'm stressed out in all of this. And yet, in all of that, Christian or not, you may fail to understand that liberty that sometimes we think we're asking God too much for small things. I've had people that came to me and said, Pastor, do you think it's crazy that I pray and ask God to heal my chihuahua? I mean, I love him. He's like a family member to me. Some of you may think, well, it's too small of a thing. God, I got carried away and I bought something last week and all these checks have bounced and I don't know what I'm doing. We're in overdraft fees and I don't know what, we're in a mess. And what you don't understand, I'm not saying that God is a genie in a bottle, but sometimes we as children of God fail to understand the price. The payment has already been made. Listen, I'm not one of those prosperity preachers who make it out like if you serve God, you're going to have a Rolls Royce and a five-car garage. I'm not saying that, but I will tell you that a lot of people think that if you're saved, you have to be poor and broke. I don't believe that. 
There are some people that I know that will never be blessed with a lot of finances because God knows their heart and they would have a tendency to let that go to their head like that the children of Israel did whenever in Ezekiel's day, whenever he said, God said, I decked you with jewels, I made you beautiful, and you played the harlot. But I will tell you this morning, it is not God's will for you to be living in poverty, to be broke. Like Kenny Morris said, I'm going to try to close with this because my heart is full. I'm just talking to you here, but I believe it was Kenny Morris, one of my favorite all-time preachers. He said, I just believe God takes care of his children and his church. He said, I believe if there wasn't but one biscuit left on the whole earth, he said, I believe God's people to get it. He's already paid the price. Will you stand to your feet this morning? Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Brother Myers, I once knew the Lord. I once served the Lord. I once really served God with all of my heart. I really went after it. I mean, I, I was dedicated. I was faithful. But I went through something that nearly train wrecked my life. Maybe you went through a divorce. Maybe you lost a child. Maybe you lost a family member or something. I've had people that have told me, Brother Myers, I'm angry with God. I've had others tell me I'm bitter with God. But as you stand here this morning, I want you to realize the victory that you need right now has already been paid for. You walk around and your mind is a train wreck, but the mental state of sanity and clarity of mind has already been paid for. The Bible said, by His stripes we are healed. I claim that right now in the name of Jesus for our sister, sister this morning. By your stripes we are healed this morning Lord physically spiritually and mentally I'm praying God for that healing right now as heads are bowed and eyes are closed I wonder if there would be anyone that will set human pride to the side and step out of an aisle and make that trip right down to an altar of prayer and get before the Lord and say today God I need to put some things before you. I've been having trouble in my marriage. There have been some things going on. I've got trouble in some relationships and, and everything has been so stressful lately. I need some peace of mind. I have struggled daily. I've been going through some hurt and some heartache and I need the hand of the master potter. I need you. I need you to touch my mind right now. Saints of God, are you helping me pray? Any of you that are here this morning, I know... I know I don't even have to ask you. There are some of you that have been going through different situations and circumstances. I wonder, will you let God spread the table and you to walk by and snub your nose up and say, I don't need any of it. I don't need strength. Some of you prayed for strength and it's already been paid for. Some of you prayed for the will to go on, but it's already been paid for. I'm just telling you this morning, it's already been paid for. Everything you need, everything you desire, that job you need, it's already been paid for. It's only a prayer away.